And now it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for this evening. Ellen Coleman is retired chair of the board and CEO of DuPont. She began her 27-year career at DuPont in 1988 as a marketing manager for the DuPont medical imaging business and served as president and executive vice president and a member of the company's office of the chief executive before being named CEO in 2009. For over six years as CEO, Mrs. Coleman led the company's focus on growth in emerging international markets and championed the power of DuPont science and global market knowledge to transform industries. As a business leader, she led double-digit growth of the company's safety and protection business portfolio, started up two successful high-growth businesses known today as DuPont Industrial Biosciences and DuPont Sustainable Solutions. She is a board director of United Technologies Corporation, an international advisory council member of the Singapore Economic Development Board, a member of the National Academy of Engineering and past president of the U.S.-China Business Council. Most recently, she joined the board of directors of Carbon, an innovative 3D printing company. Mrs. Coleman has been named as one of the 50 most powerful women in business by Fortune and one of the world's most powerful women by Forbes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ellen Coleman. I'm very excited. So again, uh, Ellen has agreed to answer any questions that we really have. So uh, we have a wonderful questions committee. So my first question is this. Ellen, take us back to 2009, and I noticed it on the video. When you became CEO, you were a 27-year veteran of DuPont when you took over during the financial crisis. How did you navigate that financial storm that was raging at that time that you referred to the fear? Yeah, it was, um, so I was informed by my predecessor uh, the weekend, uh, two days before Lehman weekend, that I would be taking over the company. And um, <laughs> that next Monday I thanked him profoundly. You know, and I thought it was the worst, I mean, here you get the big prize. This is what I've been working for for a lot of years. Uh, I, I love the company, love the science, love the people. And um, in the worst of all possible circumstances. And I said, you know, if I didn't have bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. And it, it, it was an amazing time where people were just scared. People would sit in their offices, they closed their doors because they were afraid if somebody walked into the office, we'd be asking them to leave. And, you know, I had at the time, you know, 65,000, 70,000 employees, and they were just all looking at me saying, what do we do? And we focused on what we could control. We got very simple, very fast. We said, we got to generate enough cash. Our goal was to continue to pay the dividend, to not have to cut the dividend, um, and, uh, or eliminate it, like many companies did. And so we had to generate cash. And, and when you have a large portion of your company as an agriculture company that's an annual cycle, you just, cash just sucks out of the company during one part of the cycle and it all comes in at the end of the year. I mean, we, we generated 120% of our cash flow for the year in the month of December almost. And so we couldn't allow that to happen. We had to manage it. And it really did focus 70,000 people. They were going to, you know, cut the cost they could cut. They were going to, we, you know, we didn't cut any R&D though. We didn't cut any R&D we thought was going to deliver. We managed our customer base very carefully and we were able to get through without cutting the dividend. And that was a real source of pride for the team. Absolutely. Now, when you think about your career, what were some of the key choices in your career that led you to becoming CEO? I mean, did, was it something that you planned out? Oh, God, no. I mean, <laughs> and nobody planned, well, maybe kids do today. They always say, oh, I want your job. And it's like, not if you knew everything, you wouldn't. But, um, <laughs> the, um, but you know, when, when I was a kid, I mean, I used to look out at five years. I'd say, gee, this is what I want to accomplish in the next five years. And, you know, I, uh, in the middle of my career, I had three young children, so, you know, we uh, had the travel issues back and forth between my husband and I. 
But you know, the, the jobs I took, I took some very unusual jobs from a historic DuPont standpoint. I, I was, you know, classically the company to find success is, gee, if you run a lot of assets, then you're pretty cool. And I was running a lot of assets in our titanium dioxide business when the then chair asked me to start a new business with nothing, and, but an idea he had. And, you know, um, and I chose to do it. I, people thought I did something either very wrong, I'd lost my mind, or it's just something was not right. And, because um, my phone never rang after it was announced I took this job. Bad sign, by the way, in a company like that. But um, I built a team. We built the safety business. We built it out. We, you know, we acquired some stuff. We brought some businesses together, the company, and created a five billion dollar franchise. And I learned more about myself and about leadership, about uh, what not to do, um, and what to do during that period than any other time during my career, um, because you really, you know, have to question just about everything as you're building something from nothing. So do you think taking risks is an important attribute for leaders? I do. I think that the safe route might get you there, but not always. Because what you know, my predecessor told me as, as I was coming in to lead the company, and you know, we, he reflected on a couple of things during the you know, 20 years we had worked together. The one was that he tried to change me to be more like him, and he realized that wasn't going to work. And I'm like, really? You've been trying to change me for the last 20 years? <laughs> I never noticed. But um, <laughs> so I, I didn't. But you know, and but he talked about that I was willing to take risks, but I was very transparent and I was very accountable, and that if anything went wrong, I owned up to it and I dealt with it and I made it my problem, not somebody else's problem. And he felt that was really important for the kind of complexities that, that that role entails. Now, one of the things I find interesting about DuPont, that it prides itself over 200 years of innovation. Um, in fact, I remember going to the World's Fair, and DuPont was really the king of innovation. So what innovations did you oversee during your tenure at DuPont that you're most excited about? So I think there, there's a couple of things, two that come to mind. One is the industrial biosciences area. I got involved back in the late 90s in how do you use a microorganism, an E. coli, to eat sugars and to express a monomer called 1,3-propanediol. And you can react that monomer with another monomer. You can make carpet, um, you can make clothing, you can make fibers, you can make actually without, the, the monomer itself is a natural de-icer for airplanes. Um, and because uh, biologically based. And so I felt that biology offered an opportunity to open up a whole new area where we were kind of hitting a wall with chemistry. We couldn't make this monomer chemically at a cost that was relevant, at a scale and cost that was relevant, but we could make it biologically. Now there's some big fermenters sitting down in Tennessee that make it. I mean, these things are huge, but they're very efficient. And so I really focused on how biology in this century can really bring a whole number of opportunities to the company that, that couldn't exist or wouldn't exist without it added to the chemistry, physics, and the other things we already did well. I think that's what I am proudest of. I mean, we, we've, uh, we created a business, we bought Genencore in uh, with a Danisco acquisition that increased our capability. Um, and really had, you know, we do basic research in the company. We're one of the few uh, companies, industrial companies, that does that and really create a, a, a great future for the company. Now, uh, given that you took over a company that needed change, and I know you've talked about change, I guess my question is what advice would you give our audience to people that are running companies that need change and maybe they don't have the longevity of a DuPont uh, put another way, how would you would have advised your predecessor about change? Um, is it clear when you need it, and then how do you do it without pushing people away? Yeah, I think, you know, you need to create followership, right? And I think in a company, DuPont is a very proud company, accomplished a lot of things over 210 years. Didn't do everything perfect by any stretch of the imagination. There is a lot to be proud of. In order to change that culture, and it really was a cultural change, you had to number one, understand it, number two, honor it. 
So, you know, if you, you know, I can remember hiring somebody from a big industrial company coming and taking over sourcing, and he basically told people that they were stupid and that they, you had to, that they had to do it his way. And I tell you, the antibodies in the company kind of froze him out in months. He was totally ineffective. Brought the next guy in, he sat there and listened, understood. He embraced and said, hey, this is what you guys do really well, but here are the areas we can improve. And he created real followership, and that's what you need to do. You need to understand the culture in order to change it. And many times when people enter companies, they say, oh, this is just bad. We just gotta throw it all out. And you lose a lot by that. And it doesn't have to take a long time. It doesn't have to slow down your pace. That's up to you. And that's what I kept telling my people, many of whom were afraid to make the change. And you find out going through the global financial crisis who's really up to the task and who's not, right? And, and so my first job was to create a leadership team that could go on that journey with me. But how does somebody who spent so many years in a company uh, take the top job and be the change agent? Do people believe you? Well, I wasn't considered a lifer. I mean, I had worked for 10 years for Westinghouse and GE, and although I'd been 20 years with the company when I took over, I, they still didn't call me a deponer. Seriously. I mean, I hadn't, you know, actually when I was announced, I hadn't quite crossed the 20th year anniversary yet, but, um, but it's, you know, it, I, was, I was more of a person that would ask for forgiveness, not for permission, and that's just kind of always been the way I've operated. Um, and I also listen very hard. I want to understand things before you move because you really need to understand what you're getting into with a company. And not everybody is as upfront or straightforward about the issues. You know, I remember a conversation you and I had a couple of years ago um, after you made the Danisco uh, acquisition. And I said, how did you make that happen? And you said, it's something we talked about for a while and I just thought it was the right thing to do. Was there a challenge with your board, or you just knew that it was the right fit for the company? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I had a, a, a business leader who brought it to me and pitched it to the senior team, said, I want to buy this company. And I said, you're in no shape to buy anybody. You know, you're losing share. You know, you got to make your own ship solid before you're going to add to it. But I, I promised him this. I'll go get to know the CEO. I'll get to know the company. And I'll start talking about it with the board. So we were seeding kind of this is one of the potential areas for, uh, you know, growth. And it just so happened about a year later, they came under a hostile bid. It went out for a quiet auction. And because I had done that seed work um, over the past year, it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't a, a long putt for the board or for management. It, we seemed to get it done. It was only when um, the, you know, once you announce a deal and it's a public company in, in the Europe, you gotta get 80% to be able to force the close. It's not like the US where you only need 50% of the shares tendered. In Denmark, it's 80. And so one of the nice financial guys from New York came in and took a position and basically started to, to threaten us we weren't gonna be able to close. So we had to deal with a lot of that to get it done. We were able to deal with it. Um, pretty readily, but that's where everything got a little, you know, kind of off kilter was not, it, it wasn't just a straightforward transaction. Right. Now here's one of my favorite. Um, what advice would you give to a leadership team or a CEO on how to deal with an activist investor? I mean, just one piece of advice? Yeah. <laughs> just, just one? Several. I don't know. Gee, okay, and something that can be said publicly, so that's the other yeah. <laughs> challenge on this one. You know, I think that um, companies as big as DuPont, and they're, you know, really felt, if you remember, the activism really started lots of years ago in the middle market, right? And Milken and all that kind of stuff like that. And then it, there's a lot of money running around the world looking for outside returns, and they're smart people, and they've got bright young analysts who do a lot of analytics. You've got to understand your company better than they do, but how they look at it, not how you look at it. You've got to do that analysis that said, what if I split the company in two or three or four? You know, they had so many different models of what to do, it was hard to keep track at some points. You know, what if we levered up the company and dropped our credit rating, what would happen then? And you've got to start educating your board. 
So because there, were, there was a lot of stuff in their uh, white paper that we absolutely agreed with. Do we want industry leading margins? Yes. You know, we disagreed on the, um, they would cherry pick certain companies to compare us to. And we said, here's the you know, set we compare ourselves to, and you can have that debate. But, and we agreed on a lot of things. We did not agree that just splitting the company and making it into bite-sized pieces for somebody else to come in and gobble up was right, and that's what I felt that their breakup plan wanted to do. And levering up the company, being in the ag market, we used a commercial paper window for billions of dollars on an ongoing basis, and it's a lot more costly, right, if, you're, if you don't have the A rating. And so, we know it is knowing yourself from looking at the outside in better than they do is your best defense against it. Because that you know, will open your eyes to say, well, maybe I am a little fat in some of these places and I need to take some action. Or maybe this part of the company doesn't fit or does fit. Now, do you think it's difficult for a CEO and board to figure out the right avenue to take? I mean, there are many advisors that all want to give you <laughs> their view. Uh, how do you sort through all that? I think, you know, uh, at the beginning, we had all these advisors, and they try to one-off my CFO and I. And they come in and talk to me, and they go and talk to my CFO, and then the next one would come in, and the next one come in, and the next one come in. And we just, at the end of the week, I was just crazed, just crazed. And so we called a halt to it. I took my toughest leader, I mean, somebody that people would just, say there's okay I've got to do whatever she says because you know she's just tough as nails and going to get it done and I made her kind of the central the command post and everything had to go through her and a team we established and we separated it from the day-to-day -day running of the company and it, everything went through them and then they sifted it down to the important stuff and then the CFO and I would, would meet with them and we'd talk through it. Now we could hear from any one of the you know, myriad of advisors we had, but we needed to put it in a structure in a way that then we could make decisions and see how we wanted to address, whether it was the activist or the board or shareholders throughout the process. Now one of the things I find interesting um, that as you were at the helm of a Fortune 100 company, one of your challenges was the shortage of engineers mm -hmm. to replace retiring talent from the baby boom generation. Can you talk a bit about how you attracted this new engineering talent to an old line company? You know, were you competing with oh, yeah. uh, Google. Facebook and right. Google and? Who'd have thought, and Goldman Sachs. Engineers want to go, I mean, Goldman Sachs do modeling. You know, it was interesting, because what I found is, so I sat down with our recruiters, because we were, when we were coming out of the global financial crisis, we were an old company, and we had a lot of people retiring. They were fully pension eligible, and they were leaving. And we were hiring at a rate that we hadn't hired at since the mid-'80s. I mean, at a very high rate. And it, you know, and it was finance people, it was engineers, and, and, and we had great um, you know, infrastructure around hiring scientists, I mean, pure scientists. But it was in the engineering side that we were really kind of struggling to keep up. And what I found is that, number one, we always went to the same place as we did. And number two, when I'd go to talk to the heads of those engineering schools, not one of them had a clue of what DuPont did in, you know, today. They remembered DuPont from 20 years ago. You know, oh, you got a big, you know, big fibers business. Nope, sold that a decade ago. Oh, you have a bit, you know, nope. Conoco, nope, they went out actually in 2001. So, I mean, I found that what we needed to do is go out and, and educate the kids about what DuPont was. So I started on a series as my talking tour. I would go do fireside chats, give speeches at all the schools where we wanted to recruit. Even if it was at the business school at the university, we would ask the engineers, they could all come if they wanted to. I mean, and you know, and I would, you know, basically it was a lot about leadership, things like that. It was a commercial. It was DuPont's a great place for doing great things and you want to be part of it. And so I really had to get involved and start to do that in order to be able to kind of change the tide because nobody understood why they should care about DuPont. 
And what about the number of women engineers? Were you able to attract them 50-50 or a different ratio? Yeah, I actually, uh, being a woman had that one advantage is that the women would say, wow, women can get ahead at this company. So, you know, I could look at one company or another. I aspire to great things. I, I mean, I even had one of my Japanese partners told me his daughter went to work for DuPont and not his company. He leads a major corporation in Japan. And I said, oh, really? That's really nice. And he basically, he said, because she knew she would never get anywhere in my company, and she thinks with you as a leader, she might be able to advance in DuPont. So, you know, if you got it, use it, right? Have you heard from her? Is she still there, we hope? <laughs> I, saw, I, I hope so. Yes. <laughs> we'll see. Good. Now, one of the things I find interesting is that you previously served as president of the U.S.-China Business Council. What challenges and opportunities do you see for China? Uh, I know you've also been on the U.S.-India Business Council. So how do you see China and how do you contrast that to India as opportunities? Yeah, so they're very different places, very different um, opportunities, very different governments, obviously. And, um, you know, in China, we were having a big issue with intellectual property. Uh, we had a very public case. People went to jail. Uh, Ex-employees of DuPont went to jail. Uh, American Chinese went to jail. Um, and uh, we had an uh, issue with a company over there. And I, you know, I used that position to be able to have the right conversations with the right people. We didn't want to make a big deal out of it. We didn't want to sue anybody in China. But we wanted the government to help make this right. And the wheels turn slowly in that because they do a lot of their own due diligence. But they totally removed the leadership of this company. Um, and then we, you know, we had to start over and negotiate the, the package with them. But I had some very specific reasons. China's, you know, there's um, a tremendous amount of opportunity there in your industry, in the food industry ingredient. I mean, changing from rural food to urban food, you know, establishing a cold chain or the ability to get product you know, shelf stable for periods of time. I mean, it's just tremendous opportunity there. Um, but it's gonna go in fits and starts. And they clearly, you know, wanna make sure that their indigenous companies have the opportunity to succeed as well. So, you know, you have to deal with all the vagaries around that. India, you know, India's been, you know, it's kind of been in fits and starts. And we've been hopeful with the new government in there that things are gonna change. It's been slow in coming, but it is coming. But India was kind of on a hiatus for, you know, much of the time I was there. You know, we've been successful there, again, in agriculture and in food. But on the industrial side, it's been a tough road. Are there other countries in terms of emerging nations that you think have uh, upside trends? I know we talk about Brazil and... Uh, <laughs> Not for the faint of heart. Argentina. No, yeah, wow, two of my favorites. <laughs> yeah, South America. What is the real doing now, you know? I don't look at currency every day. I still look at the stock market every day, but I don't look at currency every day. But, you know, I really find that ASEAN, if you think about the countries that comprise ASEAN, Singapore, Thailand, Cambodia, Indonesia, that area is, I mean, they've got, you know, a billion people. And you know, they're trying to form an economic unit where you can deal with them in a trading block. And that work is going on. And I think that they, you know, you know, different countries, different issues, and especially in the food industry, very different tastes around the different countries. But I think that's a tremendous area that we've seen a lot of positive growth in the last four years. OK. Now, it's interesting, when you're talking about engineers, how, do you, how does the United States immigration policy how did that affect your ability to find talent? Could you find US citizens? Did you have trouble having people leaving school stay in the US? How did that affect yeah, the so recruiting? In the advanced degree programs, and master's programs and PhD programs, there's a lot of foreign kids. There's a lot of Chinese, a lot of Indian kids, and they need a visa, and it should be stapled to the degree. And you know, we've been very, very clear about that because, you know, they want, and they've been educated in the US, they've been here for, I don't know, eight years. They want to continue to grow and develop. They want to come to companies, you know, great American companies. And so why are we making it hard for them? They're contributing great from a research and development standpoint and a science standpoint, and that helps the economy. So I, you know, so we have this, you know, this trouble with this, and I'm not sure why we should. I think there's, I think it's really clear that in advanced degrees, we should want those kids to stay here and help 
our companies succeed, and we should make it easy for them to do that. Now, one of the things we talked about was recruiting female engineers and how you built part of your career on taking risks. So my question is, there are a number of females in the audience today, and I hope many of them are thinking they want to be a CEO of a Fortune 100 company. So what are the one or two things of advice that you would uh, give to females that are aspiring to be CEOs? No, I think that you've got to follow what, it, what you want, what's in your heart. And people are going to give you a lot of advice, some of it positive, a lot of it probably not. Over the years, I'm sure you've had the same thing. I know I did. But I always felt that I was the master of my career. If I didn't like where I was, the only person that could do anything about it was me. And that if, if, you know, if that meant I needed, no, it doesn't mean you always have, I keep telling my kids this, it doesn't mean you like every boss. It doesn't mean every experience is a great one. You learn much more from the bad experiences than you do from the good experience. The good experience, you're thinking, hey, I'm pretty good. You know, the bad experience, you're sitting there, oh my God, what do I have to learn? What do I have to do kind of thing? And I think you've got to follow what's right for you. I think too many times people put external measures of success on us as individuals. And we as individuals have to say, if this is what I want, this is what I'm going for, this is what I'm going to work for and go get it. The other thing is there's a whole network of us. And we, you know, we give advice free. You know, it's worth what you pay for it. But there's a lot of groups out there that are there to help support women and to help women understand and gain kind of perspectives that can help them in their development through this, like the Committee of 200, where you know, and I'm a member, and, and, um, and they helped me. I had a couple of women from Committee 200 when I was early in my career who kind of sat me down one day and told me the facts of life. One of them was, worked for Goldman, one of them worked for AT&T, and they were talking about it. And it, I really learned a lot from them, and I think that perspective helped me over my course Good. of my career. Well, one of the uh, markers of this millennial generation, both men and women, is the weight they place on working for or buying from companies that are working for social good right. and sustainability. And I know DuPont has been a leader in that area. So how did DuPont think about building their sustainability agenda? And was it the same as driving shareholder value, or was it a separate agenda? So it was four CEOs ago, or five now, Ed Woolard. Um, you know, it was Greenpeace was coming after DuPont. They were uh, scaling water towers, unfurling long banners that says DuPont, number one polluter. Um, if you cross the Delaware Memorial Bridge, it's right around our annual meeting that year um, in you know, the mid-90s. If you cross the Delaware Memorial Bridge, pe you, people could read DuPont number one, but they couldn't see the polluter. It was down too low, and there were yeah. buildings in the way. So our 1-800 our, you know, number was flooded with calls saying, oh, what did DuPont win number one in? And, you know, so we had to turn it up. But I mean, and so he, <laughs> yeah. well, let's see. But, you know, and so, you know, we as a company realized late 80s, early 90s that we had to change, the world was changing, and for us to be successful, we had to be accepted in the communities where we operated, and we had to be accepted by society as, as, at large. And he really did a great job at changing, you know, he ch called himself the chief environmental officer. And so we started measuring at first footprint reduction. I mean, that's the place to start. What is your burden you're placing on the world? But then when Chad Holliday came in as CEO, he really changed it to say there's a numerator effect as well. That it's just not the denominator, there's a numerator effect. And we can make product that helps lightweight cars for, you know, so that we can meet cafe standards here in the United States, greater fuel economy, you know, we can lightweight planes, we can, you know, do a lot of things to really help create a more sustainable future. So we make material for solar panels, for things like that. So he helped the company really focus on that aspect of it as well. And then, you know, come the millennials and they see this history, which we didn't tell well. We really didn't. You know, it's, it's typical of us. We were, you know, we had to create, a, you know, we had to put it on our website. It wasn't even out there. Uh, and so to really show that DuPont was a very different company than what people's impression was if you go back maybe into the 70s and 80s. You know, I also look at being a leader in safety practices as part of sustainability. So I give you a lot of credit for making that part of 
Uh, we care about employees, we care about people, and today I think it's very wrapped up into one. Mm -hmm. So I know that you were one of the leaders in that. Now, one of the things I know DuPont has had a multi-year, some people call it war, some people call relationship with Monsanto. And Dow was a fierce competitor and there was a lot of litigation. So how did that year, that decade of litigation with Monsanto shape your view of litigation in the US? I mean, was it productive or was it just something that had to um, be, um, get through? So when you're dealing with complex scientific issues that are around living things, which create an even bigger issue, right? It, it's complicated. And most juries today have a really hard time getting their head around all the science. And I think sometimes our company, I know many companies like it, when we're so sure of the science, we lose sight of the reality of the situation and the perception. And, you know, hindsight 2020, would we handle it differently? Yeah. But I think one of the things I try to do during my seven years is saying to the scientists, that's really interesting, and you're probably right, but it doesn't matter because if society's not gonna accept it, it's not gonna be successful. And you have to have both, it's just not one. And you know, and you know, we have some brilliant people in the company who really are passionate about their science, but you have to infuse it with the realities of the world. I'm, I'm a big advocate that we're not training our kids in lower school, middle school, high school for the world that they are inheriting because it's gonna be heavily science and technology based and yet they might know how to pick up their phone or, and use it. But the question is, do they understand what under, underlies it, right? Do they understand, you know, how transportation is going to be in the future? I mean, we're, our kids are still making volcanoes with the, you know, baking soda. I mean, in, you know, like, they should be, you know, putting together engines and pumps and, and understanding how that kind of stuff works. But yes, and I actually made friends with Hugh. So he and, I, he and I decided, we, when I came in, um, much to my general counsel's chagrin, I, um, I sat down with him without a lawyer present, and I said, we can just keep like, spitting at each other, or we could have a dialogue, and I'm willing to have a dialogue if you are. And he said, I'm willing to have a dialogue. And it wasn't always good dialogue, don't get me wrong. I mean, we're fierce competitors. But we at least, before we would sue each other, we would at least call each other first. <laughs> and it works. And several times we ended up not suing each other because we called each other first and said, really, you're gonna sue me over that? Okay, you know, let's, because we had, it was going on way too low in the organization, and so. Well, it reminds me of a panel I was on with Hugh um, about six months ago, and the subject was, my next question, GMOs. And there are many pros and cons to genetically modified uh, plants and food, and it could be considered a science experiment gone wrong. I mean, there's a lot of media, and they all have their take on it. What's your perspective on GMO and non-GMO? So we've been ingesting GMOs for about 20 years now. There are zero known health effects, zero. So, you know, I think there needs to be, I'm in favor of federal labeling, not state by state, but federal, that's transparent, and it's not putting a skull and crossbones on the, on the side of the product, right? I mean, you know, what some people want to do is to say, this is bad, don't eat it. It's not bad. You know, it actually will help us feed the world. The problem is, is that, you know, food security, meaning the ability of a country to feed their people, you know, is an issue in many countries in this world. It's not an issue in the United States. We have a different set of issues here. But it's a high class problem that we have saying no GMOs. We're not gonna feed the world unless you can use technology to generate more out of the arable land that's being used today. The, the, the facts are there. If we're growing from seven billion to nine billion people, there's no way we're gonna feed them. Especially if we, if as they enter the middle class, which we're seeing in India and we're seeing in China, they move from a grain-based diet to a meat-based diet. And so, you know, when people were thinking that in India, well, they're never going to go to a meat-based diet because of their religious beliefs, and the answer is that's not true. They're not vegetarians by choice. They're that way because that's all they could afford. 
and a good portion of that population is moving in to other areas. And I think that the math is there. Now, should we be transparent about it? Yes. Should, but we should have it as a level playing field. And that, you know, we should work with all the food companies and the Grocery Manufacturers Association and set this in an appropriate place and let people make their choices. There are things that are naturally occurring. You know, organic farming uses a copper fungicide. Copper fungicide can kill you, but it's naturally occurring. So it's not about the things that are used, it's how they're used and the product stewardship around making sure it's done in a responsible way so the food chain is secure. And there's nothing, you know, there's nothing magic about it. It's just a lot of hard work. But I, I do believe in the technology. I have walked fields in sub-Saharan Africa where they still have open pollination, which means a corn plant a foot in every direction. I mean, and they can't even feed their families. You get them into hybrids, just even hybrids, and they can feed their families, send their kids to school, have a little bit of income kind of thing. And, you know, and I think that there's just a lot of opportunity there. Now, um, there have been a number of high-profile inversion deals. It's my favorite story to read in the journal. Uh, mergers where the resulting company is headquartered outside the U.S., sometimes driven by lower tax rates. We talked about the pharmaceutical industry. What should the corporate tax policy of the U.S. be? I mean, how, how do you think about those inversion deals? I mean, should they have economics? Should they be tax-driven or both? So, look, companies are very practical today. It's a, they're, you know, as I would go down to Washington and say, my competitors aren't all in the United States. A lot of them are in Asia, Latin America, in Europe, very different tax regimes, and I am disadvantaged because of ours. And I have to take advantage of everything I can legally, you know, and appropriately in order to be able to compete. So if you have the kind of, system we have here in the U.S. today, which is, is I think it's onerous on companies, it's people are going to look for ways where they can be more competitive globally. I mean, I think the, the countries around the world, there's a war on taxes, and everybody wants to say, transfer pricing between countries for companies is becoming the biggest issue. Italy wants to, you know, they want everything, and France wants everything, and things like that. So there's going to be a lot of transparency that's going to come there. And the U.S. has to set up a system that, number one, encourages us to remain here and allows us to be globally competitive. Now, um, here's a question about as we wind down here. Um, so you're married. You raised three children. You've been married to the same guy. It's, it, it's much easier that way. Yeah. <laughs> it just is. <laughs> And you've been CEO of a very powerful company with a proven record of results. So what's your take on the uh, difference between Sheryl Sandberg's oh lean-in philosophy, I love this question, versus Anne-Marie Slaughter contention that women shouldn't hold themselves to an ideal that they can never attain? So how do you think about that? Are they on different sides of the question, or are they really talking about the same thing? You know, I think that they're coming at it from very different directions, and I'm not sure there's an intersection there, but they're very different. I believe what Cheryl is saying is that you as a woman need to step up and let yourself be heard, that you need to participate fully and don't put yourself in the corner or in the back row, and I see it happening all the time. And I drag them up to the table, and I'm fine, I'm fine. And it's worse if it's vendors of ours, consultants or bankers, and the women are in the back row. And I'm looking at the banker saying, uh-uh, I want to hear from her. You go in the back. You know? And they're like, really? I'm like, why not? It'll be interesting. Much more fun. But I mean, so it's, you know, and I, I, I don't know whether the company does it. One of Amory Slaughter's contention is that the work environment has to change. It's not just the woman that has to change. It's the work environment. That's true. But it says that people like me, who are paying these guys a lot of money to do great work for us, needs to demand that the teams that are working for us are diverse, uh, needs to demand that they have an equal representation. I have no problem asking for that. I have absolutely no problem. I do, can, I do, do not like the way she says women can't have it all, because that presumes there's an all out there that we all want that's the same. And I think the all, for me, is the way I define it with my life, my family, my choices. 
and that's going to be different than yours. It's going to be different than any of ours. And nobody should be telling me I'm successful or not successful based on some, you know, based on their perception. I'm the one that, that makes those decisions. I'm the one that needs to be happy with that. If, you know, I, 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 I um, talk to a lot of young women at DuPont, and, and they're like, well, you made your decision. You wanted to be CEO. And it's sort of like, I'm not sure it was much a decision as kind of like you just got to that point. But it, it's, I said, but you've got to remember, this is what's right for me. It's, you know, if I had, it literally, I, told, I had to tell my daughter this when she was eight years old, she demanded that I stay home. And all her friends, parents, stay, a mom stayed home. And I said, so, you're going to give up your after school activities. Oh, no. Um, so, wait a minute, I'm going to drop you off at school at 7.30, and then I'm going to pick you up at 5.00 and then we're gonna spend three or four hours together and you're gonna to go to bed. Yeah, so you get maybe another you know, couple hours of me or when I'm traveling, you know, that, well, yeah. I said, so if I'm giving up my job, what are you gonna give up? That didn't go over well. <laughs> so, but she finally admitted, I didn't sit her down and explain to her that I'm a, I'm a better mother because I work um, than if I didn't, because I, I would have, you know, Prop, I don't know what I would have done, but it would not have been pretty. Uh, house would have been really neat, though, <laughs> as opposed to the way it was. But. Now, when you think about uh, building a great company, you've been part of that. You got to leave your mark on DuPont. How do you think companies will evolve? I mean, I think about, you know, there's so much excitement about the market cap of Google and Facebook, and I know you've just gone on a startup company. What do you think will be the definition of a great company when we look down the road? Will it be different than what you and I grew up with? You know, I think that's interesting, because we, you know, I grew up in the day of conglomerates, right? I mean, I worked for Westinghouse, I worked for GE, I worked for DuPont, you know. I, so I'm used to, and what I think is the norm is multi-product complex companies, and you just have to have really good people. And you got global scale, and you can you know, leverage a lot of things, and there's a, there's a lot of pros to it. There are some cons to it as well. And we seem to be on a trend to this sort of more narrowly defined company and you know, larger narrowly defined. But I, I think that it just cycles. I think that, well, actually, if, if I were being a little bit on the evil Ellen side, she would say that the bankers and lawyers, it's in their interest to whatever's in vogue, try to get them to switch to what's not because they make money. And then 20 years later, we go back to conglomerates because they'll make money. And so, I don't know if that resonates with anybody, but, because mm -hmm. um, <laughs> in all this stuff, the two people I know who are making really good returns are the banks and the lawyers, so that, that's, that's critical. But um, the, you know, but I do think that, that business is changing. I think that it's becoming flatter organizations. I think it's becoming much more team-oriented, less hierarchical. Um, I think it is much less, you know, hard line. It's much more collaborative. I think that's taken place even in the last 10 years. We've seen a sea change there. And I think that's good. I think I always had the contention if I could figure out how to get 70,000 people every morning when they got up to believe that what they did mattered in making the company a success, we would be a very successful company if they came in with the attitude and the excitement of what they were doing, and uh, that we, we, would, you know, we would succeed beyond my expectations, because that's what it's all about at the end of the day. It's getting people to really engage and really drive and create and do some pretty hard things in the world. Okay, well now here's my last question, um, and I love to end these sessions with, what's next for you? Uh, are you thinking about joining another company, private equity, public service, Washington, oh, you don't gosh. live that far, mm -hmm. uh, boards, you know, how do you think about spending your time in creating value? Well, um, so the last couple of years have been 100 hour weeks for the most part, because I was running the company um, at night while I was running the proxy contest during the day. So I've taken some time off, which is really nice. By the way, there's a whole other world out there. Mm -hmm. there, there really is, and there's so many fun things to do. So I am, what I am looking to is to create a portfolio of stuff that will keep me actively engaged and in different areas, um, you know, globally, uh, different technology areas. I'm mostly science-driven. 
Um, that, you know, maybe in the National Academy of Engineering, they have an interesting provocation about STEM education or science education in middle school and high school, and I'm, you know, want to see how I might be involved in that uh, because I really am serious when I say if we don't change that, then the future generations will, you know, we're not, we're not going to have as good an outcome as we could. And so I just, I don't know, I'm still figuring it out. Well, I know you're a big advocate of STEM education, right. so you see that as an important part of how you're spending Engineers time. can do anything, right? Okay. Just ask us. We can tell you. <laughs> Good. Well, thank you, Ellen. We appreciate your being with us tonight and for such an engaging well, thank conversation. You. And good luck.